So we heard a bit at the start of the session about uh, the environmental uh, water requirements and the long-term uh, watering plan. So the modelling I've been doing feeds into that. It's sort of the, the nerdy end of environmental water requirements. Um, Uh, sorry. So it's it's all about the uh, the main channel uh, water requirements. So not the floodplain. Um, it's all about uh, yeah the water in the main channel. Sorry. <laughs> so essentially, all the heavy lifting is uh, done by the ecologists, and they sort of worked out. Um, um, conceptual models for different uh, types of um, animals and, and things that live in the river. Uh, and they sort of needed information about the way uh, flow changes in terms of uh, the velocities. So they're trying to get away from the, just the, how much water goes through, like megalitres per day at one end. And start focusing more on what does that mean to velocities and depths and how that might sort of relate to how it used to be before the river was regulated with uh, weirs and locks and things like that. So the tool we used to do that uh, investigation was the Mike 21 model, which is a 2D depth average model of the whole river has been built and that's uh, Juna have done that. So they've got it in little sections from the border, usually covering the, the different regions between the locks and that uh, model can calculate velocities and water levels for um, the River Murray. So they use that sort of thing for when you get floods, for working out how high the le water level will come and what, what bits will inundate and what bits will flood and that sort of thing. So it's a tool that is available and we use it uh, to sort of help inform this, the, the questions that the ecologists had for uh, setting the environmental water requirements. So we couldn't do the whole thing because it takes a long time to run these models because they're very complicated. So we just chose one particular reach and that's between lock three and lock four. Uh, and the main reason we chose that, it's got the longest period of uh, information about the water level at the sort of downstream end uh, before the lock was put in. And that's important for knowing, because the way the model works is you have to set what the height of the water at the downstream end is and what the flow is at the upstream end. And uh, it works out what happens in between. So there's just a satellite image of the, so lot four is, is here. You've got uh, the upstream end with the borders over, over to the right. Uh, flows this direction uh, down to lot three. So that's the uh, bottom end of the model. So what we looked at was the existing conditions, just the way they are now. Uh, so with the, the lock, put weir pool at the, the current heights, the, the, the normal height. We looked at the, uh, the way it would be if the lock wasn't there, so with no weirs, and so that's the pre-development condition. Uh, we also looked at uh, weir pool manipulations, which could be a management tool um, for the environmental water needs and you could sort of raise the weir pool to water things or you could lower the weir pool to increase velocities. So there wasn't a lot of room for um, manipulation there but we did two different scenarios. So for each one of those conditions we did 11 discharges so 3,000 megalitres a day which is you know right, the, the low entitlement flow. Uh, all the way up to 40,000, which is not quite to the level that it spills over the banks, but it's sort of like close to the bank full condition. 
So, like I said, we needed to work out what the, the downstream end of the, the model height would be, and it's a bit hard to know what that is, so we had to um, uh, look at the previous data for, from before the lock was built, and sort of we just made a discharge rating curve based on uh, the monthly average flow that came from um, big mod modelling from using scenarios with no development and no um, upstream dams and all that storages. And then we compared it to the monthly average uh, water level at lock three before the lock was built. So we fitted a curve, used that curve to set the, the, the downstream water height, which is essentially the height that it would be if the water was just flowing freely. So that's the sort of output we get. It's a bit hard to see because it's so narrow, so I made a fatter version. Um, that's the, 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 you know, the lowest flow scenario we did, and the colour represents the velocity of the water in the river. You can see that at the upstream end, it's got quite a bit of different, uh, you know, higher velocity um, regions and low velocity regions. But as you get down, the it's all sort of low velocity. So that's the influence of the weir, and the weir pool makes the slow moving uh, body of water. So to contrast that, this is the before the weir went in, so pre-development, pre-regulation, you can see that it's got a high variability of velocities for the whole stream from the one end to the other, and uh, higher velocity. So that's great, but how do we sort of <laughs> put that into tools that the ecologists can use? So one of the ways was to sort of plot it up in um, sort of statistics in one kilometre chunks, you take the, the, the uh, river into little pieces and then just plot the, the range of values that uh, velocity values you get in each region. So you can see like this is the, the distance along the river. So this is the upstream end, this is the downstream end, and then you have the velocity and so there's quite high velocities at different places along the river. And the ecologists sort of uh, talk about hydraulic diversity and being a good thing. And so you can see there's a lot of, there's a big range in, in values, but so y you, you can get values as high as, you know, 0.6 and, and also no, no flow in spots. So, and if you contrast that to the situation with the weir pool, you can see that the downstream end where the weir is, it's all very uniform, so there's very low hydraulic diversity. Uh, it's all very uniform and, and all quite slow. And as you go up the river, you get to the stage where it starts to look a little bit like what it would have been without uh, the weir in, in, the, in the river. So. If you increase the flow to 10,000 megalitres a day, this looks pretty, the, the, uh, the nowhere scenario looks very much the same except that the velocities have just gone up a bit. And uh, the flow with the weirs in place, again, the, the, the top end looks similar to the before um, regulation, but the, that sort of creeps further down the river as the flow increases. So as we go to the 20,000 megalitres a day, you can see that the, the high uh, hydraulic diversity has kind of increased along the whole river, but more so the upstream end. And by the time you get to the 40,000 megalitres a day, the two kind of look very similar. So, but, um, 
Chifeng was saying before that most of the flows is sort of more like 10,000 megalitres a day. You don't really get that many, 40,000s. So they also wanted information about uh, different flow uh, bands. So you could classify the data for, from the model in terms of you know slow, very slow, moderate, fast, and uh, you got the different velocity uh, levels to do that. So with the we've got a plot here with the uh, the flow. Um, that we put in the, you know, the upstream flow through the system along the bottom axis and then the, how much of the river is in one particular velocity class. So we've got the, at the bottom, you've got the natural situation with no weirs and at the, the top here we've got the, um, the, the current situation and you can see that as we sort of saw in the previous slides, uh, there's a, <laughs> a high amount of slow moving habitat for the uh, anything sort of less than 10,000 megalitres a day. And in terms of water uh, requirements, if you wanted to get the velocities higher for say fish spawning or you know whatever environmental need that requires that you need a lot more water to be able to do that so this modeling kind of helps put a quant uh, quantify how much water you actually need to achieve the outcomes that you're looking for and the idea is also that maybe if you've got a, a limited amount of water for your environmental needs and you've got an unregulated flow coming down, you could either choose to release water to increase the peak so you get higher velocities and you could sort of use this modelling to uh, work out what exactly what you wanted and whether it's better to do add to the peak or maybe it's better to add it towards the end to sort of maintain a, a long period of flow. Uh, so. There's also what they sort of noticed is, again, what we saw before, uh, the upper end is more sort of natural and the lower end is, is always quite a lot slower. So again, for the, we divided into three sections, the upper, the middle and the lower. And so the upper bit is always quite good in terms of hydraulic diversity and velocities. But the, the bottom end is 80% you know, uh, slow habitat. <coughs> uh, yeah. And again, you need a higher discharge to get that part of the river moving. So they thought it was sort of necessary to be able to break it down so you could get, a, some, again, some quanti quantitative idea about what flows are needed to get that bit of the river reach going. So this is another plot with the three different uh, sections of the river. So you can see that anything above entitlement flow, the, the, um, the upper reach starts getting um, moderately fast moving water almost straight away, whereas uh, the bottom end, you, just, you need more, you know, more than 10,000 megalitres a day to get that sort of movement. So that's important to fish spawning, uh, reduces the algae and the, or the cyanobacteria. Uh, okay. So we also looked at the influence of weir pool manipulation 
So again, <laughs> at the, the bottom end of the, the river, if you raise the weir pool, it just makes things even more slower. Um, and then as you go higher, it, it, it makes a difference, but it's not a gigantic difference. But again, you need more water. If you raise the weir pool, you need more water to get the same conditions that you want. So it's, it, you could sort of use this information to trade off whether it's better to raise the, 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 the water level to sort of uh, increase watering of the trees and the, the other sort of bank uh, ecology, and, uh, or whether it's better to sort of lower and increase the velocities. So one, one interesting thing getting towards the end here, but one interesting thing I found was if you just drew a, uh, if you have an imaginary path for some sort of particle, which say maybe a fish egg or, or a, a cyanobacteria or something that floats along with the, with the path of the river. Um, in the before, you know, the pre-development uh, river, You'd, it would spend <clears throat> like about half a day in slow-moving uh, habitat. So these different lines are how long it would spend it in, in the different flow classes. No worries. Um, whereas under the, the current regime, it's sort of more like it spends seven days in slow-moving habitat and you know, five days in very slow. So if, if you're a fish egg, you might sort of fall out and get eaten by yabbies. Or <laughs> if you're a cyanobacteria, you'll love it. You just hang around on the surface because they float and proliferate. And then that's how you get some water quality problems. So these are the things that the ecologists are trying to manage. So um, yeah, just trying to put the numbers so that the ecologists have kind of the quantitative details and then they put that into their environmental water planning and then that feeds into what Chris was doing with Juno. Okay, thanks. <laughs>